Okay, let's begin our lecture today. First, let's recap what we learned in the last lecture. Uh, in the last lecture, we were introduced what is a signal. So a signal, simply speaking, is a function of a independent variable. An independent variable such as time, location, frequency, and in this course, we focus on time and frequency as independent variables. And at the beginning of the class, we merely focus on time. And we learned some basic concepts and the operations of signals. What is continuous time signal? What is discrete time signal? For both continuous and discrete time signals, we learned time domain transformations, three important transformations, time shift, scaling, a reversal or reflection. And uh, using the concept of time reversal or reflection, we defined even all signals, two categories of signals that have special properties. And the periodic signals. Uh, periodic signals are very important because later when you learn the signal transformations, like Fourier transformations, they are based on periodic signals. Uh, here, let me roll back a little bit to clarify something. Uh, let's look at this example, which we uh, look at, uh, which we did last lecture. We have a discrete time signal x of one minus n. When we compress this signal to one half, we change n to two n. Uh, we said that some points, in particular the points with odd numbers n, are eliminated, are removed. So we lost some information when we try to compress a discrete time signal. And the last lecture I mentioned that if we try to stretch that signal, that there are some points that we need to add, some new points that we need. But after I rethinking, I rethink this case, uh, what I would like to clarify is actually when we stretch a discrete time signal, say if we originally have a signal x of n, we want to stretch it as x of n over two, this case is not discussed within the scope of the study for this lecture. Because if you look at this signal x of n over two, when time n is all number, say n equals one, we have x of one over two, which is not defined because for discrete time signal, only x of some integer is defined. That's why we never discussed the case of stretching a discrete time signal in this course. So that's one clarification. And then for periodic signals, I feel that it would be better if you look at some practical examples. Say, uh, oh, here are three exercises. Uh, one, continuous time signal, two, discrete time signals. The question is, are those signals periodic or not? If it is periodic, what is the fundamental period? Okay, let me, so let's do this exercise. I will give you uh, two minutes. Actually, please feel free to post your answer in the chat window as seen by everyone. You could just say yes, no, yes, or so on, or put the numbers of the periodic period. Okay. 
Okay. Let's just look at the answers. Because we are looking at continuous time sinusoidal signal, and we know that sinusoidal signal has a period of 2 pi, then to get the answer, we just try to make up 2 pi. And for this case, what we find is the number 8. That's, that's very magic because if you just use the definition of uh, a period, periodic signal, so we change from t to t plus 8, we get a 2 pi here, and sine something plus 2 pi just sine something itself. So this is x of t. So x t plus a equals x of t. And it is not possible for any number smaller than 8 to get the same x of t because 2 pi is the, is the shortest period of the sinusoidal function. So x of t is periodic, fundamental period t equals 8. Thanks. The same operation just applies to the discrete time signal. We see that those equations are the same, except that we change uh, round brackets t to square brackets n. Nothing else changes. So x of n is periodic. Fundamental period is n equals 8. But pay attention that this is a discrete time signal. So the fundamental period, capital N, must be an integer. It is an integer, so we are, we are good. That's not the case for the third example. So the difference between the second and third example is that we have pi over 4 n here, but 1 over 4 n here. And in this case, we first suppose xn can be periodic. By definition, there could be an integer n, positive integer, such that x of n plus capital N equals x of n itself. If we do the calculation in detail, so we replace n with n plus n, that's what x of n plus n is. And then it's, so we just put 1 over 4n outside of it. It should equal x of n to this. And if we look at this, two, these two terms, it requires that n over 4 is a multiple of 2 pi. Uh, specifically a non-zero multiple of 2 pi because we are looking at a strictly positive integer n. But this is impossible because, so we've learned perhaps in our high school that mult any non-zero multiple of 2 pi is called an irrational number because pi itself is an irrational number. Irrational number means a number that cannot be expressed as the ratio of two integers. But n over 4, it is an integer divided by another integer. It is a rational. So a rational number cannot equal to an irrational number. That's why it is not possible to find a period n. Therefore, the signal x of n in this case is not periodic. It's not periodic. Uh, we also call it aperiodic. So the word aperiodic means not periodic. That's an example for periodic signals. Now let's move on to the uh, new knowledge that we will learn today. Today I would like to introduce two special signals that are very fundamental for the analysis of other signals. One of those signals is called the unit impulse. The other is called the unit step. Let's first look at the unit impulse. Uh, for simplicity, let's start. Uh, can I use oh, a question? Question from student, can I use capital T plus two to check if it is periodic? Uh, so, uh, not sure what it means by T plus two, uh, for, is it for the continuous time case or discrete time case? I suppose for the continuous time case, right? So if you use T plus two, then you have sign the same thing plus pi over two. And we know that sine, say sine alpha, we change from sine alpha to sine alpha plus pi over two, what we get is cosine alpha. So it's not, no longer the original signal. That's why t plus two is not a, is not a answer. I, I'm not sure if I answered that question correctly. Okay, we, we can leave the discussion offline. Uh, let's, 
another question. Okay, let, let's move all the questions uh, offline. I will, I will make sure to answer it. Uh, discrete time unit in pulse. Okay, so we look at discrete time, uh, time n are integers. A unit in power signal defined discrete time is denoted by delta of n. So in general, we denote signals, discrete time signals as x of n, but this is a special signal. So we use a special notation delta of n. What does this unit in power signal delta of n look like? Here I give a figure. And from the figure, we can see the definition very clearly. When the time n is not zero, then delta of n takes the value zero, zero everywhere. But the only exception occurs when n equals zero. When n equals zero, delta of zero equals one. So that's a single impulse at the origin. That's the unit impulse signal in discrete time. And discrete time unit step is defined also with respect to n but here we discuss two cases, n less than zero, say n equals minus one, minus two, minus three, and so on, u of n are all zero. But for n larger than or equal to zero, u of n equals one. So the point that u of n equals one include n equals zero. So at zero, it also takes the value of one. And u of n here, we pay attention to this notation. That's the standard notation for discrete time unit step signal. Those definitions, I guess, are kind of straightforward. And the next thing I would like to explain is their relationship. So there is a relationship between the unit impulse and the unit step signal. To understand that relationship, let's first look at the figure on the, on the upper side of the slide. Here we change a little bit the notation. We change the time index notation from n to m. Then this plot is changed from delta n to delta m. That nothing else changes, we just change the notation. The purpose we change the notation is that we use n for a different meaning. So here, n is a particular number. Or we can understand as a fixed and given integer n that we put on the on the axis of m. And the reason we make n a fixed integer because we want to take a sum of delta m from m starting from infinity, minus infinity to this fixed number n. So this is infinite sum. So we sum up everything from m equals minus infinity to m equals this particular n. So if n is less than zero, so here we can see that n is one, two, three, four, five, minus five, or n, if n is any negative number, then this infinite sum is zero because we are just summing up infinite number of zeros. But if n is zero or n is larger than zero, then this infinite sum include infinite number of zeros and one number one. So the infinite sum jumps from zero to one when n larger than equal to zero. So essentially this infinite sum is a function of n because it depends on n. And this function of n is zero when n less than zero, is one when n larger than equal to zero. By definition, it is exactly the unit step signal u of n. Therefore we get a relationship that u of n equals the infinite sum delta of m for m ranging uh, minus infinity to n. So it's a function of n. And speaking in words, unit step is the running sum of unit impulse. And from this relationship, we can derive the other relationship that is, so un is this running sum, which we obtained in the last page. And the un minus one, we just replace the n with n minus one, just a substitute. So if we make the difference of these two terms, un minus un minus one, is the difference between these two infinite sums. The only difference between these two infinite sums is the last term, delta of n. 
So we get this relationship delta of n equals un minus un minus one. Speaking in words, the unit in power signal is the first difference of unit step. First difference means we only make a difference between the u of n and the u of n minus one, the first step in front of it, uh, before it. And this relationship has a intuitive explanation. U of n, we plot the standard sh uh, shape of u of n here. U of n minus one, we learned from last lecture, is just a shift of u of n on the time axis to the right by one unit. So this is a shift by one unit. And then we make the difference of these two. So this is a minor sign. Then everything on the left at zero minus zero, which is zero. Everything on the right is one minus one, which is also zero. The only thing special occurs at n equals zero, which where we have one minus zero, which is one. So everywhere zero, only one at n equals zero. So this is a discrete time unit in power signal. That explains delta of n equals un minus un minus one intuitively. Okay. So this is discrete time unit in power and step and the relationship. Then next we come to the continuous time. Continuous time, the unit step signal u of t so if, since it's unit step and it, it looks very like, very much like a step, uh, its definition is the following. When t is negative, t is less than zero, then u of t equals zero so on the left hand side. When t is larger than zero, u of t equals one. Um, what we need to pay attention is that I didn't give the definition of u of t at t equals zero because u of t is a is discontinuous at t equals zero. Well, there are different conventions that mathematicians uh, define u of t at t equals zero. So they define u of zero. For example, u of zero sometimes defined as one over two here, or sometimes defined as zero. So the function is left continuous but the right discontinuous or the other way, u of zero is defined as one, so that is the right continuous, but the left is continuous. Uh, in this lecture, in this class, the choice of u of zero does not influence uh, the, our analysis result for the signals. So usually we will not specify the value of u of t at t equals zero. So this is the continuous time unit step signal. And the definition of continuous time unit impulse signal is a little bit involved. So we introduce that definition. Let's first come back a little bit to, this, uh, to these relationships in the discrete time, right? UN equals running sum of unit impulse, unit impulse and first difference of unit step. We try to extend these relationships to the continuous time. So let's first look at this running sum. So for, from an infinite sum, when we extend it to continuous time, what we naturally think about is the integral. Because as you learned in your calculus class in your first year, the simplest definition of integral, Riemann integral, is just a sum of rectangular areas. When, we, when the width of those rectangulars approaches zero, then the limit of this infinite sum becomes the integral. In other words, integral is the limit of, inf of infinite sum. So we from, start from discrete time infinite sum to continuous time we get integral. We replace n with t, we replace the upper limit n to a upper limit for the integral, which is t, and inside it is the integral delta tau d tau. In other words, unit, continuous time unit step is the running integral of a unit impulse. And then with this relationship, we can get the following because the derivative is the inverse function of integral. So ut is the 
integral of delta, then delta is the derivative of u. And also if we connect it with the discrete time, in discrete time we have first difference and uh, we know that first the derivative is a natural extension of first difference when we come from uh, discrete time to continuous time. So these two relationships for the continuous time help us, helps us define the uh, continuous time impulse signal delta of t. So we know that delta of t should equal du t dt. At ut, the unit step signal looks like this. What is its derivative? When t is less than zero, we are taking the derivative of a straight line, it's zero. When t is larger than zero, we are also taking the derivative of a straight line. So we also get zero. So delta of t is everywhere zero except the special point where t equals zero. So what is derivative of u of t at this point? Actually, u of t is discontinuous at this point, and thus it is non-differentiable at this point. So mathematicians have different methods to define delta of zero. And here is one of the interpretations for the definition. So we first start with a unit step signal, u of t. We approximate it with another signal called u delta of t. So what does u delta of t look like? It is zero when t less than one. It is one when t is larger than delta. And from zero to delta, in this very small segment, we have a straight line, we, we have a straight line that connects this, these two points so that this becomes a continuous function. And this line has a slope one over delta. So the function expression for this line, for this segment is one over delta t. So this expression is only valid within this small region from t, uh, t from zero to delta. And intuitively, as delta approaches zero, so this segment becomes narrower and narrower. And the u of delta t will approach u of t. So it will become the unit step signal. So that's first uh, First, we come up with approximation u delta of t. Next, we take the derivative of u delta of t over t. We will have it the following. So this is u delta of t. The derivative on t less than zero it's zero because we are just taking derivative of a straight line. Derivative for t larger than delta is also zero because it's also a derivative of a straight line. But in between zero and delta, the derivative is just the slope of this segment. What is the slope of this segment? It is one over delta. So if we take a derivative of u delta of t, the resulting signal delta, delta of t is expressed as follows and it's plotted on the left. So it is zero everywhere, except in this small segment from zero to delta, it has the height one over delta. And because the limit of delta equal, approaching zero, u delta of t is ut, then taking the derivative on both sides, the limit of delta approaching zero, delta delta of t is the delta of t, the continuous time unit in power signal that we want to define. And what would this signal look like if delta approaches zero? Intuitively, as delta approaches zero, this signal will become narrower and narrower and become higher and higher because one over delta will increase as we decrease delta. But as the shape of the u delta delta of t change, one thing that does not change is the area covered by this rectangle. Because it is one over delta times delta, so the area of this region is always one. As delta approaches zero, it becomes infinitely narrower, infinitely higher, but the, ar the area of this arrow is still one. So for simplicity, we plot it 
using an arrow here. And we put a one alongside the arrow, which means that the area covered by this arrow is one. Actually, it has an infinite height, but we use arrow to denote that. This is a unit impulse signal. So unit impulse signal delta of t at the end is a signal that's zero everywhere. It's infinitely high at time zero, but the area covered by this infinitely high impulse is one. And then we have the mathematical properties. If we take the integral of the impulse signal delta of t, it's always one because the integral just cal calculates the area covered by this impulse. And the more general case, if we take the integral from any number a to b, as long as zero is between a and b, then this integral should be one. In the extreme case, we start from zero minus, which means a point that is on the left of zero, but infinitely approaching zero. We end to zero plus, which means a point that is infinitely close to zero, but always keeps on the right of zero. Then this integral is always one because this integral covers the area under this unit impulse and the area is one. Now we consider a time shift of this unit impulse signal. So delta of t is the standard unit impulse signal centered at t equal zero. If we shift it to the right by t zero, here without loss of generality, let's assume t zero is a positive number. Then we change from delta of t to delta of t minus t zero, we are shifting it to the right by t zero. So this arrow is moved to the point t zero. This is a shifted version of unit impulse and the same properties still hold. We take the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, result is one. If we take the integral from any number a to b, as long as the t zero is between a and b, then the result is one. And we take the integral from t zero minus to t zero plus, the result is also one. So these are the definitions and the properties of continuous time unit step, a uh, unit impulse, out of t. And to summarize, this is the continuous time unit step, which looks like a step. This is the continuous time unit impulse, which is zero everywhere, only a infinitely high impulse at zero with area one. And the relationships, delta of t is the derivative of ut, ut is the integral delta. So after we learned the definitions of unit impulse and unit step, what I feel very useful is to introduce to you this property. So, uh, Let's first look at the figure instead of the equation. We have a continuous time signal. So time axis t, we have a shifted version of the unit impulse, delta t minus t zero. Without loss of generality, let's assume t zero is positive. So we are shifting to the right to t zero. And we consider an arbitrary continuous time signal x of t which is plotted by this blue curve. Now what we want to have is, what we want to calculate is this integral. X of t times this shifted version of unit impulse, we take the, deriv uh, we take the integral of this thing over minus infinity to plus infinity. So what is the result? Our first observation is that this shifted version of delta is zero everywhere except t0, which means as long as t is not t0, x of t times this delta of t minus t0 always get zero. For example, if you look at this segment, it's some arbitrary function multiplied zero, the result is zero. If you look at this segment, it's 
also zero. Therefore, it doesn't matter x of t, what x of t is outside of t zero. What only matters is x t zero. So at this particular t equal t zero, x of t takes this particular value x of t zero. So for this integral, we can replace x of t with x of t zero because everywhere else, it doesn't matter what, what x t is. The result is just zero. X of t zero is a constant. It does not depend on the integral time variable t. That's why we can extract it outside of the integral. And what's inside this integral is delta t minus t zero dt. From the last slide, we know that this integral equals one. So x of t zero times one is x of t zero. Therefore, we obtain the result in the blue box. So this integral is x of t zero. Intuitively, if we have an arbitrary continuous time function x of t, we multiply it by a shifted version of unit impulse centered at t zero and take the integral. The result is the particular value of this arbitrary function at t zero. Later, I will use an example to illustrate how this property is used. Okay. Uh, we have time for some exercises. Uh, the first one is discrete time signal, which we saw on the last lecture. Uh, try to plot those signals. Okay, I will give you uh, two minutes to practice yourself first. Okay, let's look at the solutions to this exercise. First, xn times un. un is the standard unit in step signal. So I plot it here. xn times un. It means, well, when I place this, uh, this uh, multiplication here, always means point-wise multiplication for every time n. It means for n less than zero, so whatever value x of n is, it is multiplied with zero. So what we get is zero everywhere. For n equals zero, we have one over two times one, which is one over two. For n larger than zero, for every n, we have the value of xn times one, which is xn itself. So the signal x of times u n just retains whatever is on n equal zero and n larger than zero. And for everything n less than zero, they are just eliminated to zero. x n times u minus n. First, u minus n is the time reflection of u n. So time reflection, originally the step is 
starting from zero extended to the right. Now after reflection is extended to the left. Then xn times u minus n, again, it's multiplication point-wise for every time n. So it keeps the original value xn everywhere n less than equal to zero. So from n equal to zero to the left, everything does not change, but to the right, xn, whatever it is, is multiplied with zero, so they are eliminated here at zero. xn times delta of n is even simpler because delta of n is everywhere at zero, so xn of n times delta of n is also everywhere at zero. The only exception occurs at n equals zero, where we have one over two times one, which is one over two. So x of n times delta of n only retains the value of x n at the time n equals zero, but everywhere else is eliminated at zero. The next one is a little bit complicated. x of n minus one times delta of n plus two. First, what is delta of n plus two from the time shift operation we learned in the last lecture is the shift of delta n along the time axis to the left by two units. So originally delta of n, the, the value one occurs at n equals zero. Now shift to the left, it occurs at n equals minus two. What is x of n minus one is the shift of x n to the right by one unit. So we know where what x of n originally looked like. We shift it to the right by one unit. It is like this. And the multiplication of these two, note that the only special point is where n equals two, we have minus one times one, which is minus one. Everywhere else, we have whatever x of n minus one is, it is multiplied with zero, so they are eliminated to zero. So this, the result is a minus one occurs at minus two, at n equals minus two, everywhere else zero. And in a similar manner, we can look at x of n plus one times u n minus two. First, x of n plus one is the time shift of x n to the left by one unit. So we plot the time shift here. u n minus two, is the shift of un to the right by two units. The standard unit step un jumps from zero to one at n equals zero. After the shift, it jumps at n equals two. So this is what it looks like. Then if we multiply these two signals pointwise over time, what happens that for n larger than or equal to two, x of n plus one, just keeps the same value because they are multiplied with one, does not change. If you look at x of n plus one, starting from n equals two, it reads one, one, minus one, zero, zero. So we just copy it, one, one, minus one, zero, zero, and so on. But for n less than or equal to one, whatever x of n plus one is, it is multiplied with zero. The result is also zero. So to the left of n equals two, the result is just a zero everywhere. Well, the last one we have, so what we want to have is x of a minus two times u of one minus n. So what is u of n one minus n? Here, we need a two step transformation. The first step is to shift u of n to the left by one unit. So u of n is the unit step that jumps at zero, then shift it to the left, it jumps at n equals minus one. Now from u of one plus n, we get u of one minus n. So changing from plus n to minus n, we are doing a time reflection. Please note that the time reflection of this one is this. So originally jumps at n minus one and extends to the right. Now it jumps at n equals one and extends to the left. So this is a time reflection of u one minus one plus n. Now x of n minus two is the time shift of xn to the right by two units, which should be 
a, a procedure that you are very familiar with. We have x1 minus 2 here, we have u1 minus n here. The multiplication of these two is that for every n equal to 1 or less than 1, we just keep the value of x n minus 2. So x n minus 2 starting from n equals 1 to the left, it reads minus 3 divided by 2 minus 2 minus 1, 0, 0. So we just copy it down here, minus 3 divided by 2 minus 2 minus 1, 0, 0. But to the right of n equals 1, everything is eliminated because we are multiplying it with 0. So all of these points are 0. 0 multiplies this, this signal with 0. So 2, 3, 4, 5, n equals 2, 3, 4, 5, everything is 0. Uh, we have a continuous time example. Uh, 10, 11. Okay, let's, uh, let me give you one minute for exercise and then let's quickly go through the solution. So hopefully we are still in time. Okay, time for the solution. The first is x of t times u of t. u of t is the standard unit step. So everything to the right of t is equal zero is keeps the same. That's why we still keep this rectangle. But everything to the left, since it multiplies with zero, is eliminated at zero. So everything to the left of, is eliminated u of minus t is the time reflection of ut, so this time the step is extended to the left. And then the result of multiplication is that everything to the left of t equals zero is retained. So we have this triangle retained. But everything to the right, since it's x t multiplied zero, then we get zero. It's the limit. The next one. So x of t plus one is the time shift of x t to the left by one unit. So this is the time shift. U of two minus t also involves a two-step transformation. First, we have u of minus t, which is the time reflection of u t we saw on the last page. And u of two minus t, we can understand it as this. First, we have u of minus t, and we replace t itself with t minus two. That's why we have this small pair of round brackets around t minus t. And then we get u of two minus t. So since we replace t with t minus two, by definition, we are shift u of minus t to the right by two unit. So we are shifting this signal to the right by two unit. This is what it is. Then what is the multiplication of this signal and this signal? Because this signal equals one everywhere for t less than two. So it keeps the original value everywhere t less than two. So two is here, left everywhere left to it, we just keep it. It doesn't change. Everywhere to the right of t equals two is zero, but it doesn't matter because it's zero anyway. So the result of 
x of t plus one times u of two minus t is actually the same as x of t plus one. This is a very particular example. And then we have the last two calculations which use this property. Let me put the property here in the blue box. So the first question is this. We notice that we have delta of t plus 0.5 here, but here it is t minus t0. So we can, we are actually replacing t0 with a negative number minus 0.5. And applying this property, we are just, the, the result is just this part. Moved outside of the integral sign, but we replace t with t0. Here t0 is minus 0.5, so it's x of minus 0.5. We raise x of minus 0.5 from the figure, it equals one. So two times one plus one square equals nine. And the next one, actually not related to the x of t here. We have delta t minus two, so we replace t zero with two. The result is just t cubic minus one replacing t with two. So two to the power three minus one, which is seven. Uh, that's the end of this lecture, but, oh, okay. So let me use one minute to quickly answer question. What happens at zero? Uh, so as I said, we didn't specify the, the uh, discontinuous point zero. So it's a discontinuous at zero. We just ignore its value exactly at this point. What we care about is the value to the left and to the right. Uh, another question is actually uh, related to the periodic signal. Uh, the question is, if the signal is continuous, is the period t equals eight pi? Uh, I guess you are referring to this signal. So this is a discrete time signal, but if we have a con continuous time x of t, which is minus two sine one over four t minus pi divided by three. In this case, yes, the signal is periodic with fundamental period equaling, uh, equaling uh, eight pi. You, you are right. Okay, uh, that's the end of lecture today. Uh, I will see you next Wednesday. Thanks. So one more question from the student. Uh, if you are still here, I would like I would be happy to answer. We multiply the oh we don't we don't have we don't have tutorial today. We have tutorial starting next week. With the unit step signal is discontinuous. How do we handle it? So uh, what I mean is basically if we are multiplying a signal with a discontinuous time signal, then we don't care and we don't discuss what happens at the discontinuous point. So in other words, if we multiply the signal with the unit step, what we only care about is the, is the value uh, to the left and the right of the discontinuous point. But at the discontinuous point, we just, well, and let me share my screen with my example. say this one. Yeah, isn't there a hole? In principle, yes, but that's, so, so there's some approximation or some convention that we follow in this lecture. Say in this example, this last slide, the signal is discontinuous at t equals two, so it's not defined, but we are multiplying this point this point x of t plus one, when t equals two, it is zero. Now multiplying zero with a point that's not defined, 
So here for convenience, we just assume it's a zero to keep this signal continuous. But actually, as you said, in principle, there should be an undefined value here, but we didn't plot it. I hope that answers your question. Okay, okay, great, thank you.